So, show of hands, how many people here watch Minecraft videos? How many of you enjoy watching charismatic people thrust into an unknown terrain, watch them collect resources and build structures and devices to make their lives in this fictional world that much more tolerable? How many of you enjoy watching YouTubers play procedurally generated survival games? Not necessarily playing these games for yourself, but watching other people trying to solve the problems of food, shelter, and protection. It's a pretty major subgenre of video game videos on YouTube, but I think it might extend beyond that. I think videos such as these are examples of a type of drama that maybe we don't talk about so much. The drama of solving problems. But Greg, aren't just about all stories about characters solving problems? Sure, when you're using the term problem solving in its vaguest sense, but what I'm talking about is drama derived from the intricate, complex nature of a problem. The existence of a planet destroying space station is a major problem that needs to be solved, but the solution is ultimately very simple. Shoot its weak point once and it explodes. It's also mutable. It's the only solution the protagonists have available to them. There's almost no room for improvisation. An ultimate evil wants to rise up and take over the world. That's a very big problem, and the only way to destroy him is to destroy a specific artifact tied to him. And the only way to do that is to take the artifact to a specific location and perform a specific ritual. There may be massive amounts of complications and detours along the way, but there is a direct solution to this problem. Sometimes the direct solution is obfuscated from our heroes. The detective may not know who the murderer is yet, but the identity of the murderer is an objective, knowable fact. Sometimes the solution is not something that should be objective, but is treated as such by the narrative. Romance stories are a good example of this, where people have one true loves, and it's love at first sight, and love is treated as if it's a binary on-off switch as opposed to being something that happens in degrees and is far more complicated than you see in the movies. This is not a matter of simple versus complex storytelling. All these examples can be as simple or as complex as they want to be. You can have a wide range of interesting three-dimensional characters. You can include poignant metaphors and theming. You can make stylistic choices in structure and presentation. The only thing simple in these examples is the central problem itself. There's little to no drama in solving these problems. You have to find that drama elsewhere. The drama of solving problems is the flip side of that. It raises issues of which there is no one objective answer. There is a multitude of solutions that must be formulated, discussed, and worked upon. And those solutions are drawn from character. Our heroes have to break into a casino. They have a number of different skills and resources from which they can approach that problem from many different angles. And they're capable of improvising brand new solutions should their initial plans fail. A sudden death in the royal family results in a power vacuum. Several factions rise up and fight for control of the kingdom. Alliances are forming and breaking when it's fitting. Nobody has more of a right to power than anyone else. It's anyone's game. There's a zombie outbreak, and a group of survivors have to work together to stay alive. They have to find shelter, they have to find food, they have to find ways of defending themselves from both the mindless hordes beating at the gates and other survivors who may want to take our hero's resources by force. These stories have an open-ended nature to them. There isn't one definitive way to solve a problem, and much of the entertainment is derived from watching characters coming up with creative solutions to said problems. The solutions devised are almost always dependent on character. If a different character or set of characters found themselves in the exact same situation, they'd probably come up with a solution at least somewhat different. If you go from a suave con man trying to break into the casino to an intelligent hacker trying to break into the casino, you end up with something very different. A vicious psychopathic lord is going to have a very different impact on the political landscape of your fantasy kingdom than a calm diplomat. If your zombie survival team has a weapons expert over someone who can cook, you're going to have different options available to you than if the reverse was true. And to bring it back to the beginning of this video, different people are going to have different solutions to the challenges a game like Minecraft raises. It is a very different experience from watching someone play a more linear game. Island in the Sea of Time by S.M. Sterling is a terrific example of a drama of solving problems book. Published in 1998, this alternative history slash time travel story involves the island of Nantucket, off the coast of Massachusetts, being supernaturally teleported to 1250 BC, before Rome, before Greece, just around the time ancient Egypt was figuring out hieroglyphics. 
With an approximate population of 7,000 people, the citizens of Nantucket have to figure out how to survive using the limited modern devices on the island and their difficult relationships with the various tribal societies of both the Americas and Europe. Survival is the primary motivation for the society. There is no going back to modern Earth. They are stuck here for the rest of their lives and somehow have to make the best of it. There's no end goal. Life just has to move on for these people. The majority of the book is concerned with the day-to-day -day problems of managing a mid-sized city with no access to power, limited supplies of food and gas, and no outside government to enforce laws and print money. We have chapters of people having meetings, taking inventory, and brainstorming possible solutions based on the resources given to them. How much food do we have, and how quickly is it going to perish? What do we have that we can plant and harvest? How do we distribute food? What medical supplies do we have? How is money going to work? What can we hunt? How do we hunt? How many firearms do we have? How much ammunition do we have? Who gets to keep weapons? Can we make other kinds of weapons? What do we even need weapons for? What else can we make? What tools do we have? What rare materials do we have to work with? Are we capable of doing some logging? What's our transportation options? How easily can we sail off the island towards mainland America? Can we sail as far as Europe? Should we open up communications with the locals? How do we communicate? Should we open trade? What do we have to trade? What do they have to trade? What do we need most? Should we allow outside visitors? How's housing going to work? Are people still bound to the property they purchased before the event? How much authority can we really place over these people? What do we do with troublemakers? How is our judicial system going to work? Where do we imprison the guilty? Should we have elections? And so on, and so on, and so on. There is no singular issue of focus. This whole book is a succession of smaller issues with multiple acceptable solutions. Practical solutions, not a lot in the way of ideological posing. In fact, having a strong political or ideological position is seen as a detriment in this book. One of the major subplots involves a group of outspoken liberal activists who see this event as an opportunity to fix all the ways Western civilization messed up the world over the last couple thousand years. They protest whaling due to the endangered status of whales in modern times, even though in this time period, whales are like raccoon common. Then these guys sail out to Middle America to try and empower the local tribes so that they can't be taken advantage of and can fight back for their continent in the face of European colonialism. The local tribes respond, by murdering and cannibalizing them. In a similar vein, we have McAndrews, a Coast Guard cadet and one of the few African American citizens on Nantucket. McAndrews becomes very interested in opening up trading with Africa in order to empower black Africans in hopes of preventing the future slave trade. But the idea is shot down because, outside of Egypt, African civilizations weren't really a thing yet. This rejection results in McAndrews joining our main antagonist, Lieutenant William Walker, who wants to get this imperialism train started. Hey, we have superior technology, why not take over the world? The final third of this book deals with Walker and the people he's brought to his side traversing tribal Europe in attempts to build alliances and form an army that can overthrow Nantucket. And honestly, it's not the strongest part of the book. Part of the reason for that is that it involves a lot of large-scale combat, with small armies and stuff. And these scenes could have done with more clarity. It's easy to lose track over where troops are, what tactics are being used, and there's no real standout moment. It's not very literary, and that's actually true of the entire book. There's a level of separation that prevents true engagement. You feel like an outsider watching other people have fun. These combat moments that make up the back end of the book feel like you're watching other people play a tabletop war game you don't know all the rules to. The problem-solving material from earlier feels like reading a forum discussion of a handful of libertarian survivalists working out the what-if scenarios in this book. That part is more fun to read, there's a lot of passion put into it, and it's not hard to lose yourself in debating the book and possible solutions, but you're still not there. Sterling characters are simplistic in that they have a handful of signifiers. They have a very specific role in the community, and maybe a character quirk that informs their role in the story. They're not one-dimensional, they just have roles that are more clearly defined here than most characters do in most fiction. 
Each individual character, from the college professor to the chief of police to the local doctor, are as much a resource to be used in solving problems as anything else. This also means antagonist characters tend to be capital V villains. Walker is a Gaston-type character, an imposing masculine force who symbolizes his desire for global conquest with that of sexual conquest. But that's nothing compared to one of his main squeezes, Alice Hong, an Asian-American physician who's also an over-the-top sadomasochist who builds a torture chamber for funsies. She is so over-the-top evil she's almost a Power Rangers villain. That's all in counterpoint to the book's main protagonist, Captain Marion Alston, who kind of makes up for the simplistic characterizations of everyone else because she is a total badass in ways you would not expect in a book from 1998. She's a woman who is a captain in the Coast Guard and commander of her own ship, the Eagle. She's black. She's a lesbian, she ends up walking around in handcrafted armor, she's trained in martial arts, and wields a katana and wakizashi. Tumblr, how is she not your mascot? Seriously, Alston is the highlight of this book. She's clearly had the most care put into her characterization. She's a realistic badass, and she's a well-written gay woman of color protagonist, which is a rarity today, let alone 1998. This element is what elevates this above what I would call a hobbyist book. This book aims to scratch the same kind of itch survivalist narratives like, say, Gary Paulson's Hatchet does, just on a larger scale and with an intricate incident that allows this book to be placed on the science fiction shelf. There's nothing wrong with narrowing the audience you're aiming for. I personally can enjoy this kind of material, I can enjoy getting into the nitty gritty details of a logistical nightmare, I can get enthralled in the drama of solving problems. For a time. I can get into a 20 minute Minecraft video where a quirky personality tries to find the most effective way to defend their camp from creepers. When you have 608 pages of it, I start to become detached from the work. Outside of Captain Olsen's personal story, there's really nothing else for this book to engage you with. When the book tries to be anything other than a series of theoretical what-if puzzles, it becomes camp. The drama of solving problems has a great deal of value because it's more reflective of real-life issues and disavows narratives of fate. It dismisses your hero's journeys for something much more human. But it is a first step towards narrative complexity, not a last step, and you need to put the work into other areas to match it. Still, Island in the Sea of Time is a pretty decent book, assuming you find yourself in the interest demographic. I personally wouldn't have complained if they trimmed 200 pages and got rid of Alice Hong, but you know, that's just how I would solve a problem.